Many beginner and intermediate pianists seek simple answers about what's right and wrong in piano playing. Although I will give you some valuable tips with regard to your piano playing today, you'll understand why it's so difficult to find simple answers to any of your questions. For example, you might hear that a so-called intended curl position is not good, that it leads to tension, or that it must be avoided at all costs. Intended curl. Sounds like intended murder. Am I supposed to feel ashamed for having those dirty intentions in my curl? This position might provoke indeed more static tension if used without efficient piano playing skills. And there are certain things to be aware of. Therefore, there is an older video available where I list five most dangerous things to keep in mind when practicing piano. However, when we play piano at an advanced level, we use all kinds of hand shapes for different types of music. In fact, some don't even use a curled finger. Instead, they use a knurled nose position. For example, for the passages that need to be played very evenly and very pearly, like Mozart, this is indeed a very good shape. Hmm. So for such spots, it works well, because it allows you to hit the keys vertically, making sure that your nail joints are really stable. When using a flattened finger position, if you are an intermediate player, your passages might sound less precise because your motions are more approximate, and there is a danger of bending the nail joints backwards which also decreases precision. However, when used this curled finger position, we really need to build the skill of relaxing the fingers that don't work properly in order to avoid unnecessary tension. Here are the three most used positions, a curved or curled finger position, as we, we might refer as like intended curl position, a so-called natural curve position. And this position, a natural curve position, is very universal. It works for like 90% of situations. And of course, a flattened finger position. But there is no bad or good, it just depends. And even when you have a piece that requires a rather flattened finger position, like this etude by Bordkevich. <laughs> So here we mostly are going to play with flattened finger positions. And actually there is a free course on this piece available, because I really want to promote music of this uh, not very famous but absolutely amazing Ukrainian composer. So don't miss an opportunity to increase your piano playing and boost your efficiency using this free course. So although our target is to play this piece with rather flattened fingers, it's really useful to learn it with a rather curled position, making sure that your nail joints are really stable, that you hit each key vertically, that there is no this approximation of movements. So then you will get to the flattened finger positions already better equipped with better reflexes. Of course, not forgetting about a proper weight transfer, relaxation between the fingers and all the other things we do in order to play piano in a healthy and safe way. Of course, when we play something like Debussy, hmm? Of course, in this case, flattened finger position works best. It allows us to shape the phrase smoothly. And actually, I have a special course on this piece, so check it out as well. And I like to focus heavily on the efficiency of piano playing, so check out my videos with analysis of famous pianists like Argerich, Rubinstein, Horowitz, and also check out my in-depth courses on piano playing by following the link in the description. Currently, I'm working on a course that will encompass my entire piano playing and teaching experiences, providing the ultimate learning program for developing an efficient and robust piano technique. That's why don't forget to subscribe and follow me on social media, turn on notifications for my videos, and you won't miss the pre-sale phase, which offers a 75% discount on the entire package.
Or, for example, you might hear from your highly established and reputable piano teachers, be careful with the pedal in pieces by Bach. We may use only a little bit of pedal or not use it at all. Otherwise, your Bach sounds like Debussy. And when somebody suddenly plays like... Like with a lot of pedal, people are like, oh la la, this is unacceptable, so much pedal in Bach, and people get eliminated from the first rounds of the competitions and so on. And I also absolutely love when people play Bach with a very good micro articulation and with a reasonable amount of pedal, because then it sounds so detailed and exquisite. So music teachers often get into these situations where they forbid their students to do something because it's considered to be inappropriate or not safe, not healthy, or simply considered to be unprofessional. But then students see it in the playing of famous pianists and say, but I heard Lang Lang plays it like that. And you're like, well, then go study with Lang Lang then. But since you came to me, just shut up and do what I say. <laughs> oh man, this is so awkward. When I used to study with two phenomenal pianists, at the same time, Konstantin Lifshitz and Eliso Versaladze, who both are superhumans in piano playing, it was so much fun because they would always say the opposite things. When I would do something that one of them suggested, the other teacher would say, this is horrible, where you got this, don't ever do this again. Once I performed a complete set of Rachmaninoff's Etudes Opus 39 at the Rubinstein competition. And I consider it to be an extremely unsuccessful performance because I didn't sleep for the whole night and the program was too new for such a big competition. But Konstantin said it was a great performance actually and that the jury were idiots for not letting me advance, knowing of course that one of the jurors was my other teacher. <laughs> But my other teacher, Eliso, who actually was in the jury of that competition, and not, it's not always helpful to have a teacher in the jury, she actually was furious about the performance. Like never before, she demolished me with her feedback. And in the past, I witnessed significant scandals, for instance, when Lukas Wondracek received the second prize in Tromsø, Norway, despite being clearly the strongest candidate. A conservative jury prevented him from winning the first prize in the competition, disagreeing with his brilliant but extravagant interpretation of Beethoven's Fifth Concerto. By coincidence, I actually happened to play the same concerto for this juror in a masterclass a few years later, and honestly, it was the least impressive lesson of my life. I literally didn't learn anything interesting or helpful. But guess what? The competition organizers were so embarrassed by this decision that they didn't invite those jury members for the next competition. Instead, they invited Vondracek to be a juror and he had no problem securing his status by winning Queen Elizabeth competition afterwards. And if you are interested in what it takes to win such a big competition, check out my other video. So the question is, who can give us clear answers about what's right and what's wrong? Where is this perfect teacher who always says the best thing, the most correct thing? Where is the truth? The answer is, there is none. For me, there is no point in seeing this diverse musical world from the positions of good and bad. So I personally really work hard on maintaining this fragile balance between um, it's not my thing, it doesn't convince me, and it's bad, it's a blasphemy, don't you dare do this, as some people do. So my friends, let me know if there is something that you find unacceptable in piano playing. If you don't like what certain pianists do, or what I do, I'm open to critique. And let's unleash a healthy, hopefully, and productive bottle of opinions in the comments. Thanks for watching this and see you next time.